name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Welcome to Metanoia Dallas. We're real excited about being here with you, and I want to get directly into a message entitled, The Purpose of the Church. And the reason why I think this is very important is because somewhere we have the wrong idea about church many times. And some of us may have, you know, church hurts. We may have came to, went to a church and it actually had a certain vibe or a certain culture that, you know, gave us a certain perspective about church. And we, we may have watched on television and we went to, and we seen particular churches on television and we said, okay, that's what church is about. And so, or we may have had a pastor in our lives for an extended period of time, and, and whether we know it or not, maybe we, uh, you know, allowed that to begin to alter our thinking about what church is all about. And so, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and be clear about what the church represents, the purpose of the church. Now, one of the scriptures that I think that I want to start off with, which is amazing, is Acts chapter 15, verse 19, it says this, we should not make it difficult for people who are turning to God. So that's the purpose of the church. We should make it difficult for people who are turning to God. Oh my God, I've seen this played out in reverse. I remember coming to Christ. It seemed like it was so many obstacles just being a Christian. I'm not talking about the part of them helping me grow. That's, that's something else. But I'm talking about just the difficulties it was just to walk with the Lord or, or just be a Christian. People begin to start having all these legalistic views and people begin to start telling me this. No, I have to do this. Or, or no, you actually have to do this. Or you have to act like this to come to God. Or you have to be like this to come to God. Now, in order to come to God, we have to make sure that we create a bridge that Jesus can walk across in order for people to meet Jesus. And so this scripture, I believe, is very important. So I want to talk about five simple things. The exaltation of God, uh, experiencing God's presence, equipping God's people, empowering God's people and expanding God's kingdom. You notice that it's all about God there. You notice every last thing, you know, every statement I made out of all five of them, it all has something to do with God. Somewhere we flip it and we think the church is about us. We come to church many times to feel good. Don't lie. You know good and well you come because, oh, I'm just feeling bad. I'm down. I need a word. It ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. It got something to do with you feeling better. You know, so you can pop your, you know, spiritual fix. Which, in reality, that really is not what church is about. But somewhere in there, we've diagnosed ourselves and we've come up with our own remedy as well, right? <laughs> Have you ever went to the doctor and said, no, doc, that's not the problem. It, it's right here. That, that's where the bone is broken. It's fractured right there, okay? And what I really need you to do, and, and that's typically how we come to the Lord. We come to the Lord many times telling him, this is what I actually need. I already know what I need. You know, and, you know I know exactly what I need, so just give it to me, doc. So I want to go ahead and make it clear about the purpose of the church. One of the things you need to know for sure is that you don't have to believe to belong and you don't have to behave to be loved. It is very important, you know, to know that you don't have to believe to belong and you don't have to behave to be loved. It's very important to know that, you know, in order to come to church, you got to know you don't even have to believe at first. You got to get that. You don't even have to believe to belong to a church, a local church. And you don't have to behave to be loved. Oh, this one really got me because I knew that after I got saved, I had to act a certain way for someone to love me. Have you ever uh, been, thought that love was on performance, the way you performed, the way you conducted yourself? Maybe if I would be better, that people would love me better. Sometimes it comes in our upbringing in, in like if you have uh, multiple children or you have siblings and it's like five of y'all and one is just outstanding. It seems like the parent is always talking about them. What? Johnny got all A's and you're over with like this report card and you're like, I don't think I want to turn mine in. Right. Because maybe I won't get the love that Johnny got. 
And somewhere in there, we kind of like get this vibe of like, you know what, if I perform a certain way, I'm loved more. And, and it's embedded in our mind that we even deceive ourselves and think that actually people think like that too. But that's not the church. The purpose of the church is to make sure that you understand who God is. And one of the reasons why that we want to come to church and, and even be a part of the church, because remember, the church is not a building. The church are people. Church is not a place you go. Church is a, per, a person to be. Church is not a place to go. And some of us, because of we hadn't done these five things that I want to talk about, the purpose of the church, we didn't do these things that when, when there was a pandemic for a while, we didn't know what to do because we didn't know how to be the church. We knew how to go to church well, though. We knew how to walk in the doors of the church. But being the church is what God wants us to be. And so the church, let's talk about that. The church, one of the primary reasons for church is worship. You know, when we come to church or when we are the church or we live out the church's purpose through our lives, worship is very important, which means exalting God. That's the primary purpose of church is to exalt God. The exaltation of God is what this is all about. It's all about lifting God up. It's all about exalting him. But sometimes when we are burdened down, it's hard to get off and under that rock that we're under and lift him up. Because, you know, we're burdened down ourselves. But worship is. And let me tell you this. Let me just give you a clear picture of worship. Any time you express love for God, that is worship. Any time you express love for God, that is worship. Let me tell you, we would all be in a mess if worship was all about getting behind a piano or playing an instrument. Oh, I would be out. Or singing. Oh, I would never worship. If you could, you know, because some people think that worshiping is singing. And that's not that's a form of worship. If you're expressing out of love, you can have a microphone and sing and not be truly expressing love to God. And you're not worshiping at all. You could actually be on this this keyboard right here and playing. And, and I'm not saying the God is playing is doing this, but <laughs> Frankie, forgive me. But the fact of the matter is, is you can be playing this instrument. And not loving God while you're doing it and you're not worshiping. You can be playing the drums back there and not loving God, not expressing love for God. And it's just entertainment and you're not worshiping. But most people, they think worship has something to do with singing. And most people think worship has something to do with playing an instrument, and that's not worship. Now, that's a form of worship if you're doing it with expression of love. And so worship is the primary reason for us coming to church or being to church. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 says it best. It says, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, passionately, with your soul. He says, love the Lord with all your mind, personally. And then he said, love the Lord with all your strength, powerfully. He says, love with all. I love that word, all. I want to go ahead and break down that word and give you the Greek construction of what all means. In Greek, what the word all means is all. Simple. Because <laughs> sometimes we make it difficult. It's just simple. All. It just means everything you have. And so love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, meaning passionately. Love the Lord with all your mind, meaning personally. And love the Lord your God with all your strength, meaning powerfully. If you're using all, when do you have time to sin? If you're living with doing it with all. So worship. Worship has nothing to do with your ability to sing, because remember, you can sing and not worship. You can play an instrument and not worship. Now, you can do that and worship as well, but it's about you expressing your love for God. And that's the point of being the church or coming to church is to worship. Another thing, and, and worship is just exalting God. Another thing is evangelism. That's the purpose of the church, evangelism. 
evangelism. Let me tell you, this is simple because it's experiencing God's presence. Because when you experience God's presence, it's important to go and share that, that love that you received. Because God's presence is important. And, and the purpose of the local church is to be a power source for the community, for the city, for the state. It's supposed to be the power source. It, that's what it's all about. And evangelism is definitely, you know, you sharing your experiences with God. Let me put it like this. Evangelism is a privilege. This is very important. It's a privilege we have, a privilege, not an obligation. It's a privilege you and I have in order to share the love of God. It's a privilege. I mean, some of us, we, we're not taking advantage of our privilege. It's not like an obligation. Anytime we're like, we're going evangelizing, and, and someone's like, oh my God, that, that, this is a privilege that we have to get to share the love of God with someone. We get to talk to someone else about Jesus and what he's done for us, and all of our failures, and all of our, our faults, and all of our shortcomings, and all our success, and all of our overcomings, and everything. That's the beautiful thing about evangelism. You share everything, and that's when is really powerful when you give it you are transparent say this is where I was at this is where I am now and I'm still a mess but God loves me and he loves you as well it, it, get, it don't get no more powerful than that when you begin to be transparent tell someone you know what I'm a mess and you may be a mess too but God still loves you and to be able to share that is very important. As long as there's people who doesn't know Jesus, let me tell you, I'm going to just go ahead and make a declaration right now. Metanoia Dallas will be committed to reaching out. That, that's what Metanoia Dallas is all about. Metanoia is all about reaching out, reaching out to people. As long as there are people who don't know Jesus, we need to always be reaching out and telling. I mean, everybody at your job should know Jesus or have at least had an opportunity Everyone that has been in, in contact with you should have heard about Jesus by now. You know, that should have been something that you, you know, you express is the love of God. That's what evangelism is. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says it's simple. Jesus said this to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. There's that word again. To all creation, everyone you can come in contact with. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what the church is about. The church is about the exaltation of God. And the church is about the experiencing of God's love. Making sure that other people experience God's love. Also, the church is about fellowship. The church is all about fellowship. The, the church is a family. And being a part of a family of God means that you are not alone. I don't know why some of us don't tap into this. We like we try to do life all alone. We won't connect. We won't engage because the simple fact we got a jaded view of what family may be. Some of us may have grew up with no father. Some of us may have grew up, you know, with a, a, a parent that worked all day or, or a parent that had certain standards. And so now when we come to church, we think that the family of God is like that as well, because we have a jaded view of what the church is all about. We don't understand because we take what we know of family and that's all we really can do unless God we allow God to minister to us and renew our minds and refresh us is we only take our experiences and we take what we've experienced in life and we begin to run things through that filter many times. And so fellowship, sometimes we remove that. We just come to church and we clock in and we're behind the walls, of course, and we say, hey, I belong to that group of people to worship, but we don't understand that it's deeper than that. You're not alone. Some of us go through stuff all by ourselves because, you know, a, a one, either embarrassment or, or you just don't want to open up or pride or whatever, but you're part of a family. You're part of a family. Fellowship is a part of the church. Something we believe here dearly is you don't have to believe to belong and you don't have to behave to be loved. Oh, how many times I've sit down and talked to people and they'll say things that was totally horrible that they done. And I'm sure that they had like a little stance like, oh, my God, what's pastor going to say? And I'm like, what am I supposed to say? I love you. Who cares what they got to do with anything? And they don't change my view of you at all. You can't do nothing to change my view of you. Uh, I, I got this little gift that even my wife say, and, and some of my family members say that I got a gift of if you've done something throwed off and you've done something crazy and it can be like just ridiculous. It, I mean, literally, and, and I'm serious. People may not get this, but seriously, I, I guess it's a gift. I don't, it don't change my view of you. 
You could quit, cry, complain, lie, have sex before wedlock, get married, have five kids, get divorced, get married again, and, and they don't have nothing to do with me. You could shoot somebody, go to jail, do this, and I won't change. It won't change my view of you. Now, I know some people don't know how to do that, so it's difficult for them to receive that. Are you getting this or no? But that's part of a family. Think about it. Your family, now, you can't change that. Some people start laughing because they know they want to change it, right? Some of y'all might want to change it, right? But the fact of the matter is you can't change it. And once you come into the family of God, they don't change that you're my brother and my sister in Christ. They don't change the fact that, you know, that you are part of the family of God because no one is perfect. And everyone knows. And, you know, that's a clear, simple statement. No one is perfect. But watch this. Everyone's welcome. No one's perfect and everyone's welcome. And so the church purpose is to engage with others. So worship is about exalting God. Evangelism is about experiencing God's love and sharing it with others. And fellowship is about engaging with others, engaging with other people, engaging with other believers. This always encourages me, fellowship, because I always realize that I'm not the only crazy one. Now, bro, when you when you talk to other people and you engage with other believers, you come to realize that's if you open up and be honest. You come to realize like, man, we all a mess. Right. Like, man, thank you. Jesus. I, I walk away so encouraged. You thought I was encouraged just to have time with you. I was encouraged like I ain't the only crazy one around here. You know, I mean, I walk off like, yes. No, for real. I, I'm serious. And that's not a, that's not downplaying nothing. That's being real. That when you're truly transparent, you don't have this self-righteous acting all like bougie, fired in your Christian walk and trying to act like you got it all together. Because there's some of those out there, too. Right. But people are just real and just being this is where I'm at. And when you sit down and talk to somebody, you say, thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I just did that last week, girl. You know, I mean, like, like, man, I just had that issue just last night or whatever. I mean, we have some uh, premarital and marital counseling classes and, and, and we're having so much fun because they are hearing me and Elena, my wife's issues, and they're really tripping out. They're like, what? Y'all did that? I said, yeah, 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 we did that. We did that. Now, we overcame it and we come in. Some of it we still battling with, but yeah, we did that. And, and it makes people feel like, wow, OK, that's cool. And then you get encouraged because you feel like I can do this, too. Like when, when I came to Christ and I started noticing how certain people were, they were cool and they were Christians. I said, man, I might can do this thing. I just might can do this. And so it's very important for us to understand that. That because you come to realize that people are just people and, and no one's perfect and you get this in your spirit. It's OK not to be OK. You know, we really need to understand that it's OK not to be OK. And some people swear up and down that like every time you talk to them, everything's fine. I'm like, wow, I'd be just wondering, how is that? How is that? Because it's always not OK. Now, not OK don't mean I'm breaking down in a fetal position in a corner, balled up and thinking I can't make it. It's just the reality of my situation. I don't like to live in deception. The reality is things are not OK, but I do know someone is going to make sure that it's OK. That's why it's OK not to be OK. And fellowship, when you engage with other believers, when you get engaged with people, you come to realize that guess what? It's all right. I don't have to put up this facade and act like I'm all right. You know, I can just be transparent, let my guards down. It is what it is. And I, and I love when people just be that way with me, you know, and stop putting up this little, I guess this little priest collar. I mean, I try to dress cool to make sure people like kind of back up off the pastor title. I try to hang out with people to make sure they drop the pastor title. But what is it going to take for you to realize I'm just a human being like you? And you can tell me everything that's jacked up about you and I ain't going to judge you. Yeah, seriously, somewhere in there we got this vibe of like, no, that's the pastor. I can't tell him that. It's like, well, OK, it's cool. I mean, I bet I'd spew out all the stuff that's going on with me, I'm going to be real. You know, I'm going to be real. Why? Because the simple fact, it's okay not to be okay. The church is about the exaltation of God, expressing our love to God, which is worship. The church is also about evangelism, which is about experiencing God's love and going to share that with other people. The church is also about fellowship. It's all about engaging with other people and making sure everybody knows it's okay 
not to be okay. And another thing the church is about is discipleship. Discipleship is very important because now what this is saying, and this is what we lose people many times, is because you got to understand it's not my desire. I come under God's desire, but this is not my plan. This is God's plan. God's desire for every believer is to grow into spiritual maturity. That's God's desire. Now, I agree with it, but sometimes when you are the tool, because the Bible tells us that, uh, you know, that he gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, all for the equipping, meaning the, the, the raising up, the maturing of the church. And so sometimes God's tool, the pastor or the leader or whatever, you know what I'm saying, to try to raise you up somewhere, some type of offense come in. But the fact of the matter is if you don't want to grow, that's fine too. That don't mean, remember, you don't have to behave to be what? Love. It don't, it don't change the fact. I don't know how many times, you know, I was running with people and, and we're growing and we're growing together and we're helping one another grow and then all of a sudden you want to stop. Well, I keep on going, but I don't condemn you and look down on you. I don't look at you in a bad way. It's like, OK, well, you know, that's where you want to go. That's how far you want to go. And that's fine. I, I still love you. And so there's something about discipleship in the church. Discipleship is all about God's desire. For every believer. To grow into spiritual maturity. And it's done through discipleship. And we're about to launch something called tribes. Tribes is going to be an opportunity for us to get plugged in with a tribe. We'll do it on our app as soon as it launches, and we'll do it on the website. Well, we'll do Zoom meetings, or if you feel comfortable, or your teacher feel comfortable meeting uh, off campus somewhere or, you know, at a coffee shop. But it will not be at church, but we're going to grow together as a, as a family. We'll, we'll have, you know, 45 minutes an hour out of a week. I know everybody can dedicate 45 minutes to an hour to their spiritual growth. And so that's that's not much at all out of a week. And so it's very important for us to understand that that this is done through discipleship, no discipleship. And let me let me let me go ahead and tell you this. Jesus gave us the picture of what discipleship is. You don't disciple yourself. I want to make sure that was clear, because somewhere we're like, ah, you know, I'm discipling myself. No, we don't disciple ourselves. I mean, look, Jesus would have just said, Peter, James, John, receive me. You're saved. Okay, go disciple yourself. That, that's not how it worked. That's not how it worked. That's not the picture of what the Bible shows us, what discipleship is. Discipleship is taking another physical human being here on earth that has the Holy Spirit as well. And it means that you become a student or you learn is someone, a disciple is someone who learns. Learns what? I'm not talking about reading books. I'm talking about learning how to live this Christian life. Learn how to shun off certain things so you can grow. Because growth is all about removing things and replacing things. It has a negative and a positive. You take things away and you add things to you. I've taken things away from my character, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through people bringing it to my attention. And it hurt. It didn't feel good when somebody else was telling me I'm wrong as a grown man. I'm like, I'm a grown man. That's what I'm thinking in my mind. You know, you know, they're telling me these things, not in a harsh way, not in a mean way. But they're actually they do this all over. That's why I say the church is not just metanoia. This is all over the world. You know, I just talked to my buddy Jared Stevens the other day. He took a, a guy that was 60 something years old and a professor at SMU, meaning he was very intelligent. And he took this guy, and at this time, he's 30-something years old, and he led him to Christ, and he taught him. And sometimes, yes, that meant sitting down and says, bro, in love and kindness, that's not right. If, if you want to continue growing in your Christian world, you have to remove that, and that's okay. And sometimes you come to some things, and it's a war, it's a battle. You don't want to get rid of that, because you like to do that. Why would I be doing it if I didn't like it? So I enjoy it. I like it. I want to do it. But discipleship says someone says, hey, and, and you know how many times I've talked to people and they don't want to stop it. And it's OK. I think they think I'm mad. I'm not mad because you don't want to stop. It. I'm fine with that. I still love you. But the fact of the matter is that's how it works in discipleship, because as we teach others, what we're learning is to live like Jesus. 
Not to live like what the church wants you to live. Not to live like what the pastors say. It's literally getting in the word. And do you know many times people will go to church for years, but time does not equal maturity. Time in the church does not equate to maturity. Always understand that. You can come to church every time the door is open, but that don't mean that you mature. You can be around 25 years, but that don't mean you mature. Maturity means I look into God's word and what it say about my life and what I'm supposed to be doing to live more like Christ. And yes, I'm not perfect. Let's get that out the way. But I'm pursuing getting that right. Like meaning, And then I move on to the next thing that God is showing me that, that is not mature and is not beneficial towards my life, my marriage, my, you know, family. And so it's living like Jesus in our thoughts, in our decisions, in our actions. It's to live like Jesus in our thoughts, our decisions, and our actions. That's what discipleship does. It takes you through a process to become who God created you to be. And not making excuses now, and, you know, and, you know, because the excuse is no one's perfect and we all know that. But we can all go on a journey together in discipleship to look more like Jesus. So when I'm talking about discipleship, I'm talking about the church's purpose to equip God's people. That's one of the church's purpose is to equip God's people, not only to preach to you, but to equip you to build you, to help you. And again, let me say this as a disclaimer. If someone didn't want to do that, we know that the majority of people aren't going to do that. Jesus had 5,000 people he would preach to, but he had 12 that committed to discipleship. You get it? So I understand if this church is packed out, you know, and we got five different services, that don't mean everybody's going to be discipled now. And I don't have that misconce uh, misconception. I don't have that. You know, and that don't mean that I don't like you because you don't want to be discipled. No, I love you because remember, you don't have to believe to belong and you don't have to what? behave to be loved. So I'm still going to love you. But the fact of the matter is discipleship is for the select few that says, you know what? I want to be equipped. I want to become all that God created me to be. And that is the purpose of the church. Bible says this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20. It says, so go and make followers of all the people in the world. Now, Jesus had big, a big vision. He said, all the people. He said, everybody should want to come up under discipleship. Everybody should see that their life is a mess and they need the Holy Spirit and some type of leadership to guide them. Everybody should know when they look in the mirror that they need somebody to tutor them and help them. Everybody should know this. He says, and so go and make followers of all the people in the world, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have told you. See, discipleship is about what Jesus said. It's not about, discipleship is not about if I don't like it. I remember I was under discipleship at times because they didn't like it. They said, well, that's wrong. That's sin. It's like, hold up. Where in the Bible does it say that's sin? It just looked like it just get on your nerves. You know how it is on parents? You know good and well it ain't nothing wrong with this, what this boy doing, but it's getting on your nerves, so you start screaming at him. Or you tell him, hey, stop that. Like, what? mom, I'm just enjoying myself. I'm having fun. But as a discipler, the fact of the matter is, if it's God's word, that's what, what the benchmark is. That's what the aim is. And so look at what God says in Romans 8, 29 as we close this up. For he knew all about us, before we were born and death, destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. How do we get like that? Through discipleship. He says, before the foundation of the world, he chose you and I to look like Jesus. He chose us to look like the Lord, and we're going to need some help. Anybody realize they're going to need some help in this thing? He said, this means the son is the oldest among the vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Last thing that I, I want to promote that the church is about, the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church is ministry. Now, when you hear this word, some people, they get, they get it misconstrued. They get it misconstrued because the simple fact they think that ministry is like you're full time, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's all you do. But let me give you a definition of what ministry is. We show God's love through service to others as ministry, just serving others. 
Ministry is when you use, when we use our resources to meet the needs of others. That's all it is. I was so proud of uh, some of these guys that come to our church and, and attend our church for some time that, you know, we seen a fence that was, uh, that was, that was uh, knocked down. They had a, a fence and these guys, they took out their own time, their own resources to go build that fence and say, you know what? These people shouldn't have a fence that's, that's, that has been fallen down. When you see someone that's hungry and you sit, you sit on the curb and you say, hey, you know what, man? You need something to eat? I don't mind getting you something to eat. Here you go. That's ministry. People have gotten the wrong idea that ministry means you're on a paid staff at a church living there every day, eight days a week. I mean, that's why sometimes it's only me and my wife that do ministry sometimes. Or, or it's not revealed that other people are doing ministry because that's what we should be promoting. Not because we want to exalt ourselves, but we should be doing this for other people, serving other people. You want to serve God? Serve people. That's all you got to do is serve people. And I would suggest that you serve people that don't look like you. Because it can be real easy to serve your own kind. But find somebody that don't look like you that's not under your household, not under your roof. You don't, you know, you don't get no points with bringing you know, groceries in your own refrigerator. That's your house. You're supposed to feed your kids now. But find somebody. That don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't act like you, and spend time. We did, a, uh, we began to start looking at the numbers of metanoia when we were, you know, going full-fledged. About 65% is Hispanic, meaning El Salvadoran, Honduran, you know what I'm saying, people, you know, Mexican-American, Mexican. And I was so happy with that. You know, and, and, you know, and, and then the other percentage, and I didn't see it because I didn't care. But somebody said one day, our church is about 85% best. And I said, no, it's not. And so then I started getting the numbers and stuff. And I'm like, why? I didn't know it was 65% though. But I didn't care. I never thought in my mind, what does it matter what race you are? You're a person. I never even thought about it because it didn't matter to me. It, don't never, it has never mattered to me what color someone is to actually serve them. Because when I'm serving a person, guess who I'm serving? I'm serving God. So it don't matter what you look like. It don't matter what your background is. It don't matter how much you might, you might hate me, you might talk about me. Whatever, I'm going to still serve you because it has nothing to do with you. It has something to do with me serving God. Because I've come to the conclusion that serving God is what the church is all about. The purpose of the church is actually also to empower you to do ministry, to serve people. Use your resources to serve the needs of other people. And some people say, well, I don't have much. Well, maybe that's why you don't have much, because what you got, you won't use to serve people. Why would he give you more for you? He want to give you more for others. Ministry is about using your resources to meet the needs of others. I believe here at Metanoia, That the church is called to meet the spiritual, physical, and emotional. I don't know how many talks I have. It has nothing to do with just spirituality. It's earthly things we're talking about. My light's about to get cut off. It's earthly. That's real. I mean, what do I say? You're in the flesh. You're not trusting God. No. How can we help you? How can we help? How can we cater to your needs? We're about to get kicked out of an apartment. How can we help? How can we serve you? Oh my God, my child is going through this. How can we help? How can we serve you? That's the next thing. Well, you know what? I'm having problems with my kids right now. How can I help? How can we serve you? It's not all about, let's open up the Bible and read the scripture. Ministry is serving people spiritually, yes. But physically and Emotionally, also relationally, just to sit down. The purpose of the church is to empower others to do the work of God, to do ministry, which is simply serving others. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, as I close, says this Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, so we need to have our eyes open, 
He says, whenever we have the opportunity, we won't see the opportunity if we don't have our eyes open looking for it. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. He says, you should always do good to everyone, but you know what? You shouldn't be acting all shady towards the people of God first and foremost, because that's your family. That's your faith family. You shouldn't be talking about your faith family. You should be believing the best about your faith family. You should have a conversation with them. If you have a disturbance, you need to be an adult and grow up and say, hey, I got, you know what? You know how many times I've had uh, discrepancies with my sisters? Oh my God. And that don't make them bad. Sometimes it's me. But when I have discrepancy, I'm going to sit down like a grown man and say, this is what I did not like because we family now and I can't, I can't disown you now, and I love you, so I want to work this out. And I want, and I might find out that I was wrong. And you know, we might find out you was wrong, but whatever we do, we're going to walk away, and we're going to resolve this situation, we're going to hug one another, love one another, and we're going to move on, because we family. And that's how the church works. The church is supposed to work like that. And this is the thing that we got to get in Acts chapter 15, verse 19. It says, we should not make it difficult. For people who are coming to God. We shouldn't make it difficult. Anybody that want to come to God, don't make it difficult. Just tell them. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus rose. And he's the son of God. Do you believe that? Simple. It's simple. Simple. I remember there was this Native American tribe. And they had a lot of crime going on in their community. And so the chief of the Native American tribe put some pretty strict and stern laws that if someone committed a crime, the punishment would be death. And so one time, you know, they were discussing that he shouldn't have to implement that. So he let his son, the chief let his son actually make sure that this was going to be carried out. And the son was loved by everybody and the son of the chief loved everybody. And so one day, this girl stole something and one of the officers came and ran to the son and said, hey, this girl stole something. We're about to stone her in the middle of the tribe in this community to make sure that everybody know that your father means business and he laid the law down and you the one supposed to implement this. You're the one that's supposed to carry this out. You're the one that's supposed to make sure it happens. So the son knew the girl very well, loved her deeply. And so the son said, okay, death is the punishment of this crime. And so they put the girl in the middle of the tribe and everybody had their stone. And they was about to stone this girl. And right before they did, the son embraced her and hugged her and they just start stoning. And in turn, they stoned the son and the son died on behalf of her crime. And that's what happened with us. Jesus became a substitute for all of our sins, everything that we done. And that's why we worship. And that's why we tell other people about Jesus. We evangelize. That's why we fellowship. Because he took our death. He took our stone. He took our punishment. You and I were supposed to be the one stone. We were the ones supposed to die. And because of that love for what he done for us, we should automatically worship. No one should have to coerce you. No one should say, lift up your hands, go right, go left, do this, sing this. We should all worship. And even if we don't even sing real good, but as long as we express our love for God, that's worship. And we need to share God's love with other people through evangelism. And we need to engage with other people, Christian believers. And always remember, God wants us all to grow through discipleship and begin to start doing ministry in some form of way and start meeting other people's needs with the resources that God has given us. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for giving us a great opportunity and a privilege to be a part of your church. It's such a privilege today 
that we can be a part of your church, that we can be a part of your family, that we don't have to believe to belong, but we can, we don't have to behave to be loved, but we can be a part of your family. We just open up our heart. Today it may be people that may not be a part of God's family. People may have not accepted Christ. People may not even believe in the church, but today I'm challenging you to open up your heart and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for all of humanity, including you, and he rose on the third day to give us victory here on earth, and we can claim that victory today. If there's a person that's online, if there's a person that may not have accepted to Christ, I ask you right now to repeat a simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I fall short of your glory. Today, I admit I'm a sinner, but I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for my sins. I confess that I need you as my Savior to save me from myself. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys and make sure you share this message.